When Ern started ratatataing about how they lost his baggage and they didn't find his room, I said, okay, Ern Delvey, I see you there. Let me sip something because I have a lot to say. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Today we're talking about Atlanta season three, episode six. Let's get into it. Off the top, this episode is so predictable. I think it's purposeful though. This is one of my favorite episodes. It's up there with episode four and five, and I'm gonna let you know why. Definitely let me know in the comment section if you agree with my theories and predictions, but let's start off with the plot line first. We're gonna do what we did when we broke down episode three, which is break it down into separate storylines. So we'll start off with a little bit of Paperboy, talk about Darius, and end off with Van and Ern. I think that's the most linear way of getting through this storyline. What I loved about this episode is everything was so blunt, so basic, so straightforward, so simplified. Everything was just out in the open for you to consume. But with anything else, there's always another level. Even Van saying it's like a simulation, that Matrix and Darius quote was an undercurrent for everything that happened. Let's start from the top. Initially, when this episode started, I was so hyped. I thought it was another dream sequence episode. It still was a good episode. I think it would have been better if it was a dream sequence without our four main characters, but it starts off with some people talking about a brand. Then we see a kid pull a shirt out the box that says Central Park with a five. Why would they make a jersey? This, like the name of the episode, is such an obvious statement about how fashion houses take the culture, commodify it, whether it be music, art, or trauma. Everything is up for grabs when it comes to capitalism. So from there, I already knew what type of time this episode was gonna be on. I said, it's gonna be light like last week's episode, but it's gonna also have a dark twist to it. The team from the fashion house is now meeting with Paperboy. We can see Darius in the back, and I think Ern was there too, discussing what's going forward after this scandal. Before we get into this, let's talk about the scandal itself. Now, we've seen over the years, Gucci, H&M, Zara, numerous companies play in our faces with things they know they shouldn't do, but they do it for outrage marketing. Do you think that's the case with what happened with this? Because there's no way. We all saw Ava DuVernay's when they see us. The audacity of them to put this jersey in the ad on a white girl. If you know the case, it's tragic on all sides. That woman shouldn't have been as assaulted. Those boys shouldn't have been wrongly accused without enough evidence. So it is, <sighs> it wasn't missed on me that they chose that as the theme of outrage, especially as we get into the theme of gentrification. I will talk about it in a bit. Paperboy is meeting with these people and they're saying, we're gonna give you gratis product. I'm thinking, Paperboy, you're Paperboy, what about your brand and your image? I would personally sever ties. That says more of a statement to the culture, to the people. Earn flips on Al the same way Al flipped it on Earn. This moment reminded me and mirrored what happened in episode three, where there's this morality issue. Before a decision is made, Earn is thinking one way. Al says something and then Earn thinks the other way to close the kind of sketchy, giving scamming vibes deal. Then in this episode, Ern is honest. He's like, yeah, I would take the free stuff, but I would also do X, Y, and Z. And I love that that sets the tone for Al to demand more later on in the episode. So fast forward a little bit. Al's at this swanky event and it's already looking suspect. We see a character, I think his name is Kellel, Kellel, whatever it is, K for short. He starts to come in, say hi to who and what, even give a little sauce to someone. I said, I don't even wanna know what their history is and rolls up on Alfred and he's like, yeah, I know who you are. He gives him a couple pointers. He hugs someone and accepts their apology for being white. I said, only, only Atlanta. Wait, was that TJ? I remember seeing on the timeline a couple weeks ago, someone confused and upset that Atlanta became anti-white. I wanna make this episode my debate on how it isn't anti-white. Like I said, with the levels, on one level, you can see it's about race and culture, yes, but if you look deeper, I think it's telling a tale on society and also on ourselves. Alfred's on this panel, a French reporter asks him, is racism over? He says, F no, because that's the obvious answer. No matter what campaign or what they do, it doesn't end that easily. It's not a simple band-aid situation. Then Kalel pipes up and saves a day by telling the reporters what he really means is this, that, and the third, 
everyone stands up in applause. One thing I love about Alana is half the tale is told by what the characters do and say. The other part of the storytelling is the setting and how they block the characters. When all the people come up in the audience and we can see the camera focus on Al, it's literally like they're silencing him with their applause. That happens all the time in the world. You may have good intentions, your voice may be loud, but the group, the universal group that Wally is talking about is louder. I love how this ties in elements and themes from past episodes like last week's episode and other ones before. It comes to a point where Al's at this meeting with the other influencers and they ask, what do you want out of this? And he starts talking altruistic Earn's definitely gotten in his head and it's a good thing. Then we go around the table and everyone else is out for their own. I was having a moment. I was laughing so hard watching Paperboy's face. I've been in experiences where it really is like that. You think that this influencer, this person is actually here for the culture and they're really not. They're here for themselves. And again, when we talk about off the top, that's what the scene is giving. But when you look a little deeper, you can also see it as there's a collective group of people who understand what the structure of the system is and they're using it to their benefit. Maybe these benefits will in essence help out the whole, but they're trying to get a piece of the pie first so they have enough power. This reminds me of Kanye and when he talked to Sway back in the day and ever since then about the glass ceilings in the fashion industry and how there's certain things he can't do and he should be allowed to do. He's a billionaire, he tells us every day, right? So I thought that was very eloquently done, but very simple. One of my favorite lines was when one of them, I don't know if it was DeMarcus or DeMarco or whatever that guy's name is, Sam, or if it was kal that said, you're new to this, we're true to this basically. Paperboy's looking at it with fresh eyes. That moment didn't miss me. The one where Paperboy was like, is he allowed to say that? It seems like it doesn't sound right coming out of him. Why is he coming for DeMarco like that? Maybe DeMarco is mixed, maybe he's light. Maybe he's white passing, who knows? I thought that was interesting about who can have a seat at the table. Paperboy comes up with this grand idea to do it for the hood. He even makes an Instagram or iPhone video to send off. I love his enthusiasm. We don't get to see Paperboy be enthusiastic like that. We've never really seen him perform. So I love that bit. Then we get to this point where you hear his voiceover on a commercial and I said, say it ain't so. That commercial had me laughing because I could actually see it on an Instagram ad on a feed near you. On one level and one layer, if you can look at it as just white and black as a race issue, sure, let it be that. There was only one black guy and he had the money phone. How stereotypical. Plus, did he say something? If he did say something, he was on some mumble rapper hit. The predictability in this episode is so purposeful. It's like hitting us over the head. Paperboy storms in the meeting, angry AF, and they don't even know how to react. They're just like, we gave you what you want. And I think that's what a lot of companies think when they try to co-sign a movement or feel like they're part of something. At this point, Kello comes to save the day the same way he did on the panel. He pulls Paperboy out tells him, listen, I got 100K from them. You gotta have a way to make them fund your stuff. They're not gonna just help you with your movement. They're not gonna teach us how to give back to ourselves because then that messes up their coins. And it's so true. When you think about it, what company is gonna teach you how to pour into yourself? Even if it transcends culture, to be race neutral, let's use Sephora as an example. Sephora is a store that essentially sells based on our self-conscious desires or our insecurities. If I want clear skin, I'm gonna go to Murad. If I wanna smell good, I'm gonna get a Killian perfume. If I feel like my hair is not curly enough, I'm gonna try Diva Curl. Everything about the world of beauty, and ironically Sephora is owned by the same company that owns Louis Vuitton and all these other high-end things, is a proportion of selling you an image of what you could be or what you're missing. That is capitalism in its essence. So understanding the system and making it work for you is essentially what that conversation was about. It transcends race because no company, whether it's race, whether it's clear skin, whether it's femininity or masculinity, is going to teach you to love and respect yourself and pour into yourself. And in this example, they're not going to teach people to give back to the hood because we're all the hood, according to that commercial, right? There's this idea that a corporation's interest is for themselves and for appeasing as many people as possible to have that income generated. Grand opening, grand closing. That was my favorite theme, but my favorite character, of course, is Darius. So we're gonna break down his plotline next. 
Darius is craving jollof. He says it off the top when Paperboy wants food before the meeting, which is not really professional, but I'm here for it. I'm surprised the fashion house didn't offer that before they met. I feel like when you reach that caliber, they usually have food on deck, but okay. So Darius is like, yo, I'll get some jollof rice. Of course, she's like, jollof was jollof. He started talking about the Nigerian prince cam. I said, why you gotta say that? Jollof rice is no joke. If you've ever went to a jollof rice war event, you know. The fact that she said, oh, I thought it was Ganyan. Those riders are trifling and they're fighting with fire. You have to acknowledge Nigerian jollof rice. I've had both. I won't say which is better because I still have to go out in these streets and I don't want anyone to come after me. Now that I think about it, I love Darius, but I got to say this. He's not the best judge of character. First socks, now Sharon. You can't invite everyone to the cookout. Not everyone should be immersed in the culture or can appreciate it as much as it needs to be appreciated. Maybe that's his lesson in this season. Unfortunately, they can't get him jollof rice, but one of the women there, I don't know what her position was. She's not a runner. She's higher up. Her name was Sharon though, right? She puts her hand on his lap, a little too comfortable there offering to take him on this out of the way adventure to go to this jollof rice spot he heard about. They go, we find out he's Nigerian and it all makes sense. I've been wondering where he's been getting his sauce from. Like he's just got that swag. So they go back and forth, him and the server. And it's funny that they pan in from a show that I have no idea what's going on, but the faces, it's all about the expressions. Anyways, back to the storyline. The race card is really triggering to a lot of people and a hit dog will holler, but at the end of the day, if you're here to be entertained and educated a little bit, you shouldn't take it so personally. Just look at it for what it is. It's an account of what's happened and happening. And instead of retreating and being mad and in your feelings about it, just look at it for like, wow, this is really a mere reflection of our society and ourselves. The server and him are kikiing. I love that moment. I really want a Darius origin story. If not that, an episode where maybe we go through his childhood, his teenhood, and how he came to be. He's a mystery, an enigma to me. Outside of this, we've always just known Darius as a quirky black guy. We didn't get to know his roots. Aaron at one point seems super intrigued and immersed in the culture and then sis loses me in fact i get secondhand embarrassment only because i realize that i've done this exact thing you go somewhere new you're experiencing a culture whether it's a restaurant or a whole country and instead of immersing and enjoying and indulging in it you're trying to insta reels tiktok it you're trying to shazam songs instead of just indulge and be present and when she asked for the business card i said this girl's up to no good Mm -mm. no 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 doing the most talking about investments no 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 i don't really know why but this moment kind of paralleled with paper boy in that meeting and how influencers or this woman who is not an influencer are in these environments where they're consumed by creating and generating income essentially and i've done that before there's trips that i've gone on that i've been too busy vlogging or making look books or trying to create a tiktok or a moment instead of enjoying the moment we've all had moments where we try to snap click take away instead of take in as much as we can lapse time one day i'm sure of it that's how gentrification works anyways he goes back and the place is closed I hear Sharon's voice calling him from the Niger Bowl, a food truck across the street. Homegirl bought out the restaurant. She did mention though that they were looking to sell. That really speaks to gentrification. It's so easy to look at one culture and say they're bad, they're taking over. But what is it really? It's capitalism. There are people who are willing to sell away history to the highest bidder. If you look at Brooklyn and other places that have been gentrified, there's a lot of culture and history there that's being crumbled because there's a different class that now sees that as prime real estate. I really fell out when she offered him the Darius bowl with peaches in it. Disrespect. Disrespect. After that moment, I felt him when he threw it away and then when the jogger yelled at him about recycling, that's how it is. A neighborhood can change overnight. Even with the pandemic, there's been people complaining about Texas and Tennessee and other places, I'm trying to think, but they're evading me, that have moved from New York and California. They're used to paying exorbitant amounts for rent or for homes, and they're driving up the rent in these places that are not used to it. Then you have the people that have been living in these states trying to save up for years and now priced out. And it just really speaks to, is it a race thing or a social economic thing? It could be a little bit of both. That's enough of Darius's story. I could talk more about it, but I'm gonna leave it on that. Lastly and lightly is Van and Earn. 
Why was Ern asking the front desk staff of a random hotel for the Apple Store location for his nicked Apple Watch? What type of time are we on, literally? He's not rich, rich. He got bougie overnight. I love the glow up and grow up, but that I was for a nicked Apple Watch. Apple Care doesn't even cover when your phone is really broken. He spots Van in the lobby. He approaches her first calmly, then he's about to get on his Zay, the ultimatum type of time, and cuss her off real good. After he says, You send me a thumbs up. I feel him though. I would be a little hurt. I'd be a lot hurt if someone sent me a thumbs up after six days. Van is just playing it cool. You know what this is? It's mirrored. If this was season one and Ern was acting that way, we wouldn't even bat an eye. I think it's because Van is a woman and she's a mother and there's this idea that you should be responsible the same way Ern said, anything can happen. Your mom didn't know where you were. And then she flips it on him. Does your mom always know where you are? I thought that was a funny moment. And then when the woman runs up on her and tries to accuse her of stealing, I said, yeah, Van did that. She was a thief in episode three. I wondered where she got the bag from because did she buy one thing and snatch another? It's possible that Van stole. I'm leaning on that. The same way I'm leaning on socks aim being ish. They go to the hotel room that they swindled the situation for. I swear this entire season is giving swindler season. They scam for a room, which was so Anna Delvey to me. I said, you guys, mm, I'm leaving that alone. They have a little bit of an intimate moment. He apologizes. She says, you worry too much. Again, that mirror energy. They are about to kiss. He said, did you steal the wig though? And that you can just see his gears are still working. Lights out, next day, she ain't there. My only prediction for that is he gonna find out Daria hit. There is no way. The fact that she brought up a Daria's quote when they were that close in proximity, no. Let me put these glasses back on. Not that I can see any better with them, but hey. Now that I see how well this tied in everything else from the past episodes, I don't wanna predict too much. My only other prediction is Paperboy is gonna go further down the rabbit hole. He's definitely teetering on the lines of morality here. And it's funny that Ern had to kind of remind him like, while well, you're here, make it work for you. All in all, I really like this episode. The underlying theme is thievery. Cause when you think about it, stolen culture, stolen wigs, stolen everything. Sometimes I think because I can't see well, I try too hard to see into things. We appropriate culture in so many ways on so many levels and we're not even aware of it. And we're also a part of it by consuming it. So I thought it really spoke to that. I love episodes like this because you can look at it and just have a good laugh, which is meant for that, but also give yourself that moment to kind of reflect and see, you know? Where do I fall into this? What part do I play? Am I part of the system? Am I scamming the system? Am I fighting the system? Am I failing the system? Am I being taken advantage of by the system? Yeah, it's a lot. I did a little bit of yoga this morning because last week I was reaching and I, my arms were sore, but I don't think I reached that much this week. Let me know. I just know that all in all, this episode is something that you can look at one way and feel a little discomfort for what they're saying off the top. But if you wanna look deeper, we can all be accountable for the parts we play in society, right? So on that note, I'm gonna wrap up this. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, tap the like, comment below anything I missed, anything you'd like to add or anything I said that kind of zinged. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.